yourself in the mirror and accept that if you weren't a racist, you condone what a racist did. So that's to me the same thing. It's the same thing. So I, I agree with you. Big show, you got a big following. So uh, God bless you. I appreciate it. Hey folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing, forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Now, follow me on Twitter at Bad Brad RSR. Again, that's at Bad Brad RSR. Well, today, folks, I got a special guest. He is a principal at Bruce Drysdale Elementary. He is a pastor and he is a Democratic candidate running against Republican incumbent Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina. Now, I would say the district, but this is where it gets a little bit confusing. And he's going to talk about that today on my show because they're doing a lot of redistricting in there. And I don't think it's probably a good thing, but he'll explain it to the viewers. So I want to welcome to my show, Eric Gash. All right, Eric. First of all, good evening now. <laughs> welcome good evening. back to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. It's a pleasure being here. Absolutely. Well, hey, let's let's start before we have any technical difficulties like we had this afternoon. Right. Uh, let's start out like this. Uh, COVID stories. How have you been dealing with COVID in the last two years? Any personal stories? How's cases in your area? And so on. Yeah, um, we've seen a spike, you know, over the last uh, probably month, month and a half, I guess, like the, the rest of uh, the nation has. Um, I think, um, um, you know, from what reports are saying, it may start coming down soon. Um, you know, back when uh, COVID first started, I'd, I'd taken over as principal at my old elementary school at Bruce Drysdale in January of 2020. <laughs> right. And so only a few months later, you know, planet Earth shut down. And uh, so I had to, you know, lead 463 students and about 75 staff, you know, uh, faculty and staff through the pandemic. Um, and it was kind of, you know, you're flying the plane with duct tape and chicken wire and, you know, you're putting the plane together in midair. And so right. um, hats off to uh, to our teachers and uh, school administrators and janitors and cafeteria workers that still fed kids during the pandemic. Um, we had our school counselors going out, uh, driving buses and parking in neighborhoods that had Wi-Fi, you know, here in the in the rural mountains of Western North Carolina, you know, Wi-Fi is still uh, spotty at best in some right. places. And so we, uh, yeah, just like everyone else, you know, we, we've never experienced anything like this where the entire planet was shut down, no trains, planes or automobiles. And so, um, and, you know, it seems we're going to be living with COVID you know, for a while now. And so uh, um, it's just becoming our new normal. Things like this, you know, the the Zoom calls are, <laughs> are our new normal now. So right. uh, we've been dealing with it well and uh, hats off to first responders and our uh, nurses and medical professionals that are working, you know, triple time, just trying to keep this under wraps. Okay. Well, like I said, we do 360s on my show. Okay. So we're going to start at the beginning and I always tell my guests, we know that the internet is not always correct. So if I have something wrong in my notes and it's not factually correct, say, hey, Brad, it's actually this. I will not be offended. Certainly. Okay. Gotcha. So it, it looks like you were born in Hendersonville, North Carolina. That's correct. Is that correct? Born and raised. Fifth generation mountain man. Yep. Okay. Fifth, yeah. As soon as I, I saw Robert <laughs> Redford and Jeremiah Johnson. You ever see that movie? <laughs> Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah. I am. In the mountains. And it's cold. It's That's crazy. right. So you, you you have your Davy Boone hat on to keep your head warm. All that. Yeah, I need Davey, something Davey to keep Crocker. his head warm. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about if you would growing up there. Yeah, growing up in uh, in a small town in the mountains, um, you know, not a whole lot to do, and that was a good thing. At, you know, back in those days in the in the seventies and eighties, um, you know, you went out and played, and you know, nature was your playground, <laughs> right? And your mom's like, "Get outside! It's too hot to stay inside. Get outside and play." Um, but um, you know, I, I loved it. You know, we had a great childhood growing up. Um, you know, we, uh, a lot of friendships that were built that, you know, are still existing today. Um, uh, just, uh, the close knit community here in the mountains is what I absolutely love. You know, uh, Friday night football is still King Friday night football was so great. They made a movie out of it, you know, <laughs> with Friday night lights. Um, and, and that was our escape, you know, it was, uh, you know, playing sports out and about sandlot football, basketball, baseball, uh, whatever the season was is, is what we played. 
you know, okay. little league T-ball. We, tr- we played one game of soccer <laughs> as, <laughs> as kids, but we couldn't, yeah, that, that wasn't our cup of tea. You couldn't really hit people like we wanted to. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it's, it's lovely growing up. It's a beautiful community. Okay. Now it looks like in high school, you were a standout football player. So Debbie is the football person in our family. I'm the boxing guy. She's a, don't tell anybody, New Orleans Saints fan, but we know that they, <laughs> they didn't do nothing this year. But they did have a lot of injuries. So in fairness to the Saints. Or, fairness to the Saints. fairness to the Saints, they'd have injuries. So what position did you play? Um, well, in high school, I played offensive line uh, and D-line, D-tackle. Uh, I was center, actually, uh, up to my junior year, and then uh, I moved to tight end. Um, in college, I played um, outside linebacker. Uh, and when I had uh, a shot uh, in the NFL, they moved me to inside. So uh, I've been really a defensive minded person. Um, I love defense. Uh, I was D coordinator before I became head coach uh, at Hendersonville or co D coordinator. Um, but yeah, football is my escape. But actually, football is my last sport that I ever played. My okay. brother and I were always, you know, too big to play the little mites and midgets. And my mom wouldn't want us to play up with the older guys, you know, so we didn't get a chance to play. We played flag football, um, you know, until I got in the seventh grade. But uh, baseball was my first love. I could really? play baseball all, oh, man, all day. When I was 15, we won the uh, North Carolina um, Babe Ruth Championship, the state championship. And so we got to go to Huntsville, Alabama and play in the uh, Little League World Series, Southeastern region. Okay. We won one and 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 lost two. I th- we played like Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida. I can't, I think we beat Georgia. I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, we uh, won one and, and lost two. So we didn't get a chance to, to move on from there. But baseball is my first love. Um, my junior year in high school, we won the state championship. Uh, in basketball in high school. So that was pretty neat. Um, came close in football uh, my junior year, but uh, didn't quite make it. So Okay. And it, it looks like you're in a scholarship to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where yeah. you study communications. Yes. Is that correct? That's okay. correct. All right. Talk about your time in college. Oh, oh, I loved it. I came in uh, with uh, Mac Brown. I was part of his first recruited class in 1988. And um, yeah, we had a great time. We struggled those first two years. We uh, were one in 10 my freshman and sophomore year. Uh, we had a lot of young folks start and I started as a, as a true freshman. We had, I think, a total of six uh, starting that year on both sides of the ball. So, you know, we were young. We took our lumps. Uh, my junior year, um, we turned it around. We were six, four, and one. And that one tie uh, was Georgia Tech. The year they tied with, uh, I think it was Nebraska for the national, Nebraska, Oklahoma for the national championship. They had to kick a, a 56 yard field goal in Keenan Stadium in okay. Chapel Hill to tie us. Or we would, they would have been their own blemish and they wouldn't have, you know, tied. And that was back before they had the playoffs, you know, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, okay. And uh, yes, yeah, seven and four my senior year. And uh, so we turned the corner uh, and we never went to a bowl game when I was there. But as soon as I left, they went to like 10 straight. <laughs> you know, oh, wow. after that with Coach Brown, he got them, I think, to a oh, number five or six in the nation uh then he left and went to texas and won a national championship down there with uh this little insignificant quarterback named vince young i don't know if you uh-huh. heard of him, oh, no, yeah, <laughs> that guy never heard of him <laughs> yeah yeah but coach brown is back in, in chapel hill and you know we have okay. have long lasting uh, friendships and relationships with those guys and some great times there and you got your degree in communications is that what i have my degree in speech communications yep okay uh, and I would later go back to Gardner Webb University to get my master's in uh, educational leadership so, okay. or master's in administration uh, really is what it is when I went into uh, uh, administration in high school here. All right. And in your bio, it also says you went to the NFL for a short stint. Yeah, I uh, signed with the, the then Washington Redskins. They're now the Commodore uh, right. commander. Sorry, commander. not the Commodores. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a singing group. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I didn't, uh, didn't make it out of camp. I got cut. Um, but the Patriots had signed uh, my brother, Sam. And so I went up to New England to, uh, uh, you know, to, to really play with them. I had a contract, but I walked away from that. Um, but yeah, I had a little stint in the NFL. This was, yes. I signed with the uh, Washington the year after they won the Super Bowl. So I was in the locker room with, uh, you know, Mark Rippon, Art Mark, I remember Ricky Sanders. Um, on the defensive side, they moved me to inside linebacker. I was in a, a skull session in a hotel room with Matt Millen, Wilbur Marshall, Monty Coleman, Andre Collins. I'm sitting here like, 
man, I was just, I just watched y'all win the Super Bowl. It was unreal. Charles Mann and all those guys, the Hogs, uh, Joe Jacoby. It, it was, it was a uh, was uh, uh, unreal experience. What year? That, well, that was that was in '92. I was um, yeah. I was stationed there in '92. I remember ripping. Yeah, I remember when Mark mm -hmm. Rippin was there. So I got a question for you. That's the Buffalo yeah. Bills behind you, right? Isn't that Buffalo mm. Bills? It is the Buffalo Bills behind me. Okay. That's my brother's helmet. He played with Buffalo for three years. Okay. Uh, went to the Pro Bowl for two of those years. Um, and little little factoid: he was the only running back ever selected uh, in the history of the NFL. Uh, to the Pro Bowl with zero carries in that year, strictly wow. for blocking. He was a fullback. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, he won the uh, Super Bowl with the uh, with the Ravens in 2000. He was on that team. Um, played with the Patriots for six years in Buffalo. Your brother, three. Did? yeah. No yeah Sam no Sam kidding. Gash is his name. Yeah. Okay, I bet Debbie knows him. Knows the name. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. So, yeah, we'll go with. So since we're talking football, I would be yeah. remiss if I didn't ask you. Who's your Who's your pick for this? Is it this weekend? Is the Super Bowl? Yeah, this weekend is Super Bowl. Ah, I gotta go with the Bengals, man. It's, uh, they're from the AFC North. Now I'm a huge Steeler fan. I grew up a Steeler fan. Uh, my brother was a, a Cowboys fan, and so we were naturally whatever he did, I did the opposite, you know. And so in the '70s, you know, Steelers and Cowboys had some epic, uh, epic. Oh, they battles. sure did. Terry Bradshaw yeah. and Stallback. That's oh, yeah. right. That's right. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm a, a Steeler fan. And so the, the Bengals really handed it to us <laughs> this year. Um, yeah. and plus there's, a uh, um, a guy by the name of Robert Livingston, who's on their coaching staff for the okay. Bengals. He coaches safeties, but he graduated from Hendersonville high school just before, um, I started coaching there. So he's from Hendersonville. So I like to see the local guy do well. He'll be, if they win, he'll be the third, um, uh, person from henderson county or yeah to, to win a super bowl mickey marvin was the first okay my brother uh and then it'd be uh robert robert livingston if they win well, so for, I'm full, for the Bengals. full disclosure i'm rooting for the Bengals because debbie is from louisiana of course she likes the saints but she also loves lsu which we have paraphernalia all through the house joe burrow uh, that's right she wears camaras <laughs> even though i hope camara i hope this charge isn't uh isn't uh, um I hope that there's more to the story than what came out because you know you just got in trouble. Alvin Kamara oh. just got arrested for assault. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he just got oh. arrested for assault. But she's uh, an LSU fan, so Joe Burrow, of course, is LSU guy. So I'm rooting. Chase, yeah. That's right. So okay, so after after college, it looks like uh, you wound up in Barbados. Yeah. Doing work. I was curious, what type of work were you doing there? Well, I was in Barbados. So when I went up to Boston uh, to work out, live with my brother, worked out with the Patriots, had a contract. I couldn't sign until uh, March of uh, 93. And so I um, uh, I said, hey, let me do up my resume. I have a degree. Let me send it out to some folks and see what, you know, kind of see what I can what I can do, football is going to end one day. Uh, and so I, I answered an ad in the paper for this uh, warehousing or wholesale company. And uh, so I went in for a, uh, an observation. You know, they do door-to-door -door sales and marketing and consulting and things like that. And, um, the guy that actually owned the company happened to be in Boston <clears throat> uh, for a couple, of, a couple of weeks. And so um, we started talking after I had my observation day, and he's from originally from Grenada. And he said he was wanting to take this concept of, you know, direct sales and marketing, consulting and all these things back to the Caribbean. This was in the mid 90s. And uh, he said, Eric, you, you have the pedigree. You, you know, I'd love to to go back down there with uh, with you. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, and uh, so I had a couple of months. This was in December, December the 7th of uh, of 92. So I had a couple of months um, just to kind of kill, you know, I was still working out and stuff, mm -hmm. thinking I was going to play with the Patriots and uh uh, after a few months, um, he really took a liking to me. I started to excel and grow in the company. And he said, Eric, I want to take it back to the Caribbean, to Barbados with you. And this was in Boston in the wintertime. <laughs> right? And I said, no hey, <laughs> yeah, no brainer. And, uh, and so I walked away, uh, you know, from that contract and and uh, spent 14 years in, in Barbados. And I met oh, my wife. Wow. She's from right. there. Yep. Yep. She's the love of my life. Uh, our kids were uh, were born there. We have three kids, two boys and uh, a girl. Uh, our, our, my daughter, Maya, she's the youngest. She's the baby of the family. Um, and um, yeah. And so we came back here in 2008. Um, okay. Just to replug back into to to my family, to to this community that I love so dear. Okay, and it looked like uh, you also after that period, uh, 
you uh, got commissioned as a pastor. Yeah. Later became a missionary. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, we uh, in, in Barbados, we uh, joined a church uh, down there. And, and me, I'm the type of person that um, if I like something, I'm all in. <laughs> right. And no holes barred. That's how, that's how I approach things in life. And um, yeah, we uh, I was like a, the first worship leader in the church. Uh, we my wife and I led a, a small Bible study group at our homes uh, midweek on Wednesday. And I just got plugged in. Um, you know, I grew up in the church and, um, you know, God just kind of, you know, led me back uh, to that, to my to my heritage, to my Christian roots. And um, uh, we uh, left in in January of 06. Uh, to St. Lucia on a church planning mission in, in the mission field. And so we spent two and a half years there. So we went from Barbados to, uh, to St. Lucia. Um, we left everything, you know, th uh, in Barbados and, and came my wife's family, uh, took our kids and, and we were there uh, for two and a half years. And then God called us back here. Um, and we started a church, uh, founded it in 2008, Speak Life Community Church. That's where I'm the uh, senior pastor there. And uh, yeah, we just love God and love others and, uh, okay. and keep it moving. Good. Now, it looks like as well, more, more recently, you became the first African-American principal of your childhood alma mater, which you had mentioned a little bit earlier, Bruce Drysdale mm -hmm. Elementary. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, first uh, um, African-American principal in Henderson County. Um, okay. since 1965. Uh, and uh, actually our junior high school um, was now the middle school, but it was the, uh, the black uh, school here in Henderson County. It was called Ninth Avenue School. Um, and um, a lot of folks, you know, if you were from Henderson County, Transylvania County, a lot of the neighboring counties would, would come there um, and, and go to school. And my, my parents graduated from uh, Ninth Avenue School. Okay. Uh, but in 1965, uh, they integrated uh, Hendersonville High School. And so uh, they did away with uh, the Ninth Avenue School. The building is still there, but I'm the, the first um, first uh, Black or African-American principal in the county. I was uh, also the, the first Black head football coach um, in the county and the second in Western North Carolina. Um, and so that's, uh, I'll be glad when there are no more firsts, <laughs> right? But somebody yeah. somebody has yeah. to be first, but here we go. Okay, well, it's very commendable. Congratulations on yeah. it. That's an honor. Thank okay, you. let's segue into the political stuff. Now, uh, I'm gonna need your help. Okay. And I gotta set this, before we start, I have to set this up for the viewers and I'm not actually being funny. I do, I pride myself on doing a lot of solid research on my guests. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to need your help because when I was researching the race, it's very, very confusing, which I know that you know better than me because I pulled stuff from Ballotpedia, or I think that's what it's called, and different things. And with all of the, I don't know if it's gerrymandering, I don't, I'm going to let you explain here in a minute. Okay. Whatever is going on with the districts down there, it's very, at least to me, it's very, very confusing. So what I would like to do is start out with, you're running against Madison Cawthorn. What district? I know I put 14, I think, in the press release. But then when I start doing research, it looks like some things have changed. And it's a different <laughs> I'm confused. So what I need you to do, my brother, for the viewers, first, before we get into your, your, you know, your, your platforms, your stances, and that, let's yeah. talk about what district is it and what is going on. Please explain. Okay. As best I can. Okay. <laughs> I just had an interview uh, with our local TV station today and they're asking like, okay, on Friday, the court struck down the maps. Yes. Now what? Right. Okay. So there were proposed maps by uh, the General Assembly, uh, which is a uh, Republican controlled General Assembly. And uh, so they gerrymandered the districts, um, you know, to cut people out. They, you know, carved out precincts uh, in, in a few, like in our district, they carved out a precinct to protect uh, the seat of, you know, an incumbent up in uh, district now 11. And so our district is district 14. Okay. Uh, and yeah, yet because of the census, we have had the state had to add a district. So there were 13. So now there's an extra 14. Okay. Um, in our district, uh, it shifted to the left about seven points. All right. So it, it benefited, you know, the, us, you know, the Democratic Party, um, and it made it a very competitive district. Well, down east, oh, it, it shifted, you know, Democratic districts to now it flipped it to Republican districts. 
Um, and, and it's the gerrymandering. You know, unfortunately, both parties are guilty of doing it. And I just want fair maps. Look, give, give me a shot. You know, I'm a coach. I'm an athlete. Listen, I don't want to get off the bus and look at the scoreboard, you know, to play a football game. We're already down two scores. And I look at the referees and they're the parents of the visiting team, yeah. <laughs> you know, of, yeah, of the yeah. team that we're playing against. Yeah. It's like we can play as hard as we want. But man, it's going to be a, a, you know, a really, really hard battle. And so I just want fair maps, nonpartisan. Look, man, get an independent uh, source or team to do it. I just want to have a chance and folks want to feel empowered and that their vote matters. And so as it stands right now, District 14 is a, a D plus, uh, sorry, an R plus six, right? It was an R plus 15, but it was cut in half. District 13, which is right well, well, next let me, door. Let me ask you that. Let me okay. stop you there for a second. So for the viewers and for me too, what thank does you. R plus six mean? What does that mean? Thank you. Thank you, Brad. I'm, I'm sorry. I, See, I, I didn't know that before I jumped into this. No, that's right? okay. okay, so so in each district, they're going to give you a Republican plus six points, six percentage points. So if with all things being equal, if everybody if everybody votes, the Republicans should win by at least six percentage points. Okay, I got you. Okay, okay? and like flip it for Democrat. Okay. So um, this this was a R plus fifteen points, which is almost mathematically impossible, but it okay. cut it down to R plus six. Gotcha. District thirteen, right next to us, which is a new district that was formed because of the census, it is an R plus twenty. Right. So really, who, whatever Republican wins the primary, they, they're going to win the general. I mean, it's it's mathematically impossible for a Democrat to win. And so across the state, you see these, these maps playing out that way, whereas it may have been competitive, now it's an R plus 10 or R plus 12. And so, you know, the, um, uh, the Democratic Party said, wait a minute, we need to, we, we got to look at this, got to do something about it. And so it was taken to the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, and they said, you know what, you're right, these, ma these maps are gerrymandered. They kicked it back to the General Assembly. The General Assembly, which is Republican uh, controlled, now has until the 18th of this month to come up with new maps, OK, okay. Um, that the courts will then say, OK, we're good. Let's run with it. So that's kind of where we are now. And so and here's the thing, Brad, um, the incumbent, uh, the, the representative in the seat now is choosing to run in District 13. The say district that part again. You got it. So. So, so, so the incumbent, you know, our current congressman right. has, is choosing to run in district 13, which is right next door to us. Hmm. Right. He's also under, and we may get into this a little bit later. He's, uh, um, th there's a group of voters that are trying to, uh, two uh, former justices as well, or judges are trying to keep him off the ballot. Right. Because of the January 6th thing. Because of the January right. 6th. Oh yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So a uh, question for you, with local races, researching you, right now there's, de there's a couple Democrats and a couple Republicans that are running. Is that correct? For this seat, that is okay. correct. There are four or five Democrats running in the primary. Right. And I think the last count was eight, maybe nine Republicans that are, that are interested. So, is it, so since you actually are my first guest on that is uh, actively running for a seat. Is there a Democratic primary and then whoever is the leading contender of all of you is the one that's going to run against Cawthon? Is that how that works? That's that's correct. Okay. So it's like it's like the it's like the general with the president. So you have a primary. So when is the primary? The primary right now <laughs> is May the 17th. Okay, May the 17th. Which has been kicked back from March the 8th. Okay. Because of because of the litigation with the maps. Okay. Do, are, do you have any upcoming debates against fellow Democratic candidates? We have one this Friday. Okay. Yeah, we, we certainly do. And we've had a couple. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, we have one this Friday coming up. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is your, your issues it, are educate, and I'll let you go into a little bit more, but your three main uh, areas, from what I understand, is Education, economy, and environment. Is that correct? That's correct. Call them okay. big E's, big three. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and take the mic and, and talk about each one. 
Okay. Uh, education. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that uh, being an elementary school principal, uh, seeing how um, kindergartners come that have been in preschool, um, they have behavioral skills, social skills, and they have those learning skills. They, they're ready to be in a group environment and to be educated and to learn versus the kids who hadn't gone to preschool. Uh, whether it be economic reasons, social, re whatever the case is, but they, parents can't afford it. I mean, childcare is through the roof. They come in and so they don't have behavioral, social or learning skills. And so we're having, you know, to spend half the day or half the class period with trying to get them to sit down, behave. This is how you hold your pencil. Don't throw, we have to share. Whereas when kids go to uh, preschool, they learn these skills at an early age. Now this was staggering to me out of 41 industrialized nations, the United States of America, the, the greatest country on planet earth, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Ranks 37th out of 41 industrialized nations yeah. with educating our three to five-year-olds. That is unacceptable. So when we hear um, universal pre-K or early childhood education, that's exactly what we're talking about. We have parents that, I mean, they don't have a choice but to stay home and, and, and raise their kids because they can't afford, um, you know, they're not making a living wage enough to afford preschool or, you know, for their kids. So there's a gap missing Right. And, and that's, a, you know, is, is, is a huge disparity. Um, and so we're talking about universal pre-K. It's, it's proven. We have data. The facts are there. And we need to do that. That increases um, the productivity of our kids coming in. It frees up parents to be able to find jobs and go to work and get into the workforce. We need that so desperately. So that's the, I mean, that that's the main issue. And, you know, we look at college tuition and, and uh, um, community college and things like that. But, uh, you know, I'm ready to stand on the hill and defend till kingdom come early childhood education and universal pre-K. And so we look at uh, the economy. We're talking about green jobs. I know that we cannot flip a switch right now and all of a sudden everything's green. Everybody has zero carbon footprint, but we can start moving the needle, you know, and looking at solar and wind. And we're already seeing, uh, already seeing electric vehicles and battery power, you know, how the major um, uh, car companies are already moving in that direction. We should have been doing it 30 or 40 years ago, right? We're seeing these ex extreme weather patterns. Mm -hmm. We're breaking records every year with name storms and, you know, so many hurricanes that we're having to switch to a different language to start naming them, yeah, <laughs> right? True. Um, and so we have to take care of, of our environment um, because we're seeing it. Um, and we're seeing them more frequently and living in the Caribbean for a little while. I've been through a category five hurricane and they're no fun, right? A category one is not even fun, but we're seeing the, in, the increase in these extreme weather patterns. On the West Coast, we're seeing droughts and, and forest fires burning up on the East and the North. Uh, we're seeing floods. Um, and so we, we, have to, we have to take it seriously. And as a pastor doing counseling, the first step in getting better is admitting that there is a problem. <laughs> right yes, if, you're, if you're addicted you have to admit okay there's yes. a problem before we can we, we can uh, we can address it and so with climate change uh um we have to call it what you want climate change or extreme weather patterns we have to do something about it the earth is, is telling us um that something's wrong and so those are i call them big e's big three um and like i said we'll defend them and and the vast majority of folks especially here in our district they agree with it i have no doubt i have no doubt okay more personal question I want to ask you as an African-American man. When you see, um, we don't have to, I, I'm not asking you to bash anybody and, and all that. Usually I don't pull no punches, but I'm, I'm doing it a little bit differently <laughs> tonight. Uh, I like I said, because you're my, my first candidate that I've had on. So I'm doing it a little bit differently. I, I will say this for the viewers. They know it already. I am not a fan. And, and the reason why I wanted you to have, uh, have you on the show is I am not a fan of Mass and Cawthorn. I'm not a fan of his evil vitriol. I'm not, a, as a serviceman that gave 20 years and 28 days, I have a problem with anybody saying that January 6th was just political discourse or it was a false flag and this, this, this repetition of just, uh, just terrible, terrible yeah. things that he says and does. But what I want to ask you is, as an African-American man, uh, when you see Trump at a rally and you see, and you know, you know they're being paid, guys in the back that have the shirts that say Blacks for Trump, or you see Candace Owens or Larry Elder who had the, the audacity in California to say, and I quote factual, 
you know, he ran in the runoff uh, with Gavin Newsom when he tried to recall him. And he said that slave owners should have got reparations. He literally said this. Or somebody like Ben Carson, who, I mean, the people that I name, I feel I, I am a strong, a strong supporter of the African-American community. I'm in a uh, interracial relationship. And I always put out on Twitter, I always put out a thing I, almost every day where I say all lives matter only when black lives matter. And I get a lot of people that come after me for that statement and I don't care. They don't even understand that it's not even, it's not even, the, the movement is one thing, the statement is another. And they, they, they can't grasp that because sure. they try to minimize. So my question is, how do you feel when you see that in a country that you obviously love, you became a pastor, you're, you're moving humanity forward, which is my big thing. You got into education to help children. You care about young kids, one of the things in your platform. How does it make you feel when you see people doing that? And, and, and unfortunately, African-American people doing that. Yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, and I should have said this at the start, thank you for your service, Brad. Um, I know that we live in the land of, of the free because of brave men and women like you and that are continually standing in the gap for us and protecting our freedom. So so thank you. Um, love you. God bless you. We pray for the troops and, you know, every chance we get. Um, you know, but we live in a country where everyone is free to express their own opinion, to express their self. Um, you know, it, it hurts my heart um, when when I hear and see things that, uh, you know, for anyone that, uh, um, that uh, you know, tries to oppress any people, you know, and, and as a Black people, yes, we have been oppressed. Um, but I, I don't like bullies, <laughs> right? I didn't like them when I was a kid when they were picking on me. And so as I grew up and grew in stature, um, I stood up against bullies. Um, and I see that this is what we're dealing with now. You know, doing nothing was no longer an option for me. And, you know, when I, when I saw two summers ago, just, uh, just the upheaval that our nation was in, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the killing of George Floyd and just, mm -hmm. just everything that cascaded from that, I could either get, get bitter or I could get better. And mm -hmm. I chose to get better. I had an opportunity to, to speak at one of our, um, at, the first and, and only March for Justice that we've ever had in Hendersonville. Um, and I spoke there and I had a chance to just, you know, call out police or call out leaders and things like that. But I, I chose not to do that. And here's why we all sin and fall short, but we have to, a responsibility. The church bears a responsibility. Our communities, mm -hmm. uh, black, white, yellow, green, you name it, we all bear responsibility to look each, at our neighbor and give them the benefit of their humanity. Um, you know, I'm a, a police chaplain as well. I, I back during that time, uh, law enforcement reached out to me, elected officials reached out to me, county commissioner, city council, locally elected officials, as well as statewide um, officials, uh, clergy, the chamber of commerce. These folks reached out to me, um, not because I have put myself on this pedestal, but because they know that I love this community and that I love people. And I'm going to think of their needs above mine. And so they reached out and said, Eric, how, what, hey, we need to do something. How can we stay ahead of this? What can we change? What can we do? Um, and I was encouraging other people to run at that time. I said, hey, young people, the three young uh, African-American ladies that organized that march. I said, y'all run. I'm going to back you. I had them. I taught them in school. I was so proud of them. And they said, Coach Gash, you run and we're going to back you, <laughs> you know. Um, but when I see it, I look at it as an opportunity um, to, to have discourse to, to talk you know uh along the the march route to the courthouse to our historic courthouse i saw two groups of people um one i call them the long gun posse mm -hmm. they had on full fatigues and they had long guns and they were standing yep. along the route yep, and i saw are. them yeah and i said i said wait a minute what the first thing i thought about was shades of wallace down in miss i was like oh not this again and but I saw my cousin standing near them and I said, hey, you know, these guys, I want to talk to them, right? Because see, I wasn't going to let the facade of, or just my, my prejudices and preconceived notions, I wasn't going to let that stop me from reaching out and finding out what was going on. And so a couple of days later, I was in their gun shop, right? <laughs> and I said, hey, this is who I am. This is why I was there. Who are you? Who are y'all? And why were you there? Because this is what I saw and this is what I felt. 
and we found common ground on things. A few of them actually started coming to church with us, oh, wow. right? But we found that common ground. We, you know, they had aging parents, so they were concerned about health care. A few of them had kids in my school, right? So mm -hmm. education is important to them. And so we found that common ground. And as we kept walking down the, the route, there was another group, and they had on their motorcycle colors. And on the back, they had Confederate iron, right? And so as I was in there talking to those fellows from the gun shop, I said, I want to talk to those guys as well. One of them happened to know his daughter was married to the leader of it, of the motorcycle club. Next thing you know, a few days later, a week from the march that Saturday, eight of them came to my church. I invited all of them, but eight of them showed up. And I said, hey, guys, this is why I was there. And I called them, brother. Who are you and why were you there? I said, I'm not going to let the facade scare me or intimidate me. Let's have a discussion like grown people, like grown men. Let's come to an understanding. Be rest assured, we didn't agree on everything, right? <laughs> but right. we found common ground. Okay. They too had aging parents. They had kids in our school system. So we found that. And there's a quote that I, that I live by. There are a lot of quotes, but one is this. Social change moves at the speed of trust and trust moves at the speed of relationships. We have to start building those relationships. I can look from afar and assume certain things about people, but until I get to know them, until I get to know their story, I never knew or I'll, or, I'll, or I'll never know. And so when I'm talking to these business leaders and law enforcement, I'm saying, listen, be intentional about it. Reach out. Don't be intimidated or scared by somebody that looks different from you or, or, or you have a perceived notion or prejudice of what they are, talk to them. I guarantee you they're just like you. And so when I see these things, um, Brad, I, it, it hurts my heart because some people are being used, right? Just as a visual, mm -hmm. but it's like, um, you know, just in, in all you're getting, get an understanding. And so I, I'm, I'm at that point to where I'm no longer going to stay on the sidelines. I'm saying, Hey coach, put me in, I'm ready to go. And so I, I mean, I, I and I openly have conversations with folks. I meet with, you know, Republicans, Democrats, independents. It, it doesn't matter. It's about coming to an understanding and, um, and working uh, toward the common good that's going to help everybody. Okay. And my next question, actually, you mentioned Republicans. I grew up not completely in the South. I'm from New York, but I lived in Florida and I was stationed in Pensacola. And I know that, um, I'm not going to say large numbers, but a lot of older African-Americans are very conservative and they're pro life. So they actually are Republicans. I met a lot. I was surprised, but there are a lot of, or there was. I'm curious in your area, uh, even if, even if you, like you say, you're talking to all different groups, yeah. but are you seeing older African-Americans that are Republicans, but they're not happy with what Trump did and what they're seeing within their party? They're still pro-life and they're still conservative, but they're not happy with what the, the Republican party has become. Are you running into People out there that are like that? Yeah. With my, my grandma, uh, we call her Big Ma. She was a Republican till mm -hmm. the day she died. She said, because Lincoln, Lincoln freed the slaves, yeah. I'm, I'm a Republican. Yeah. Um, and dare I say the dynamics have shifted, uh, you know, with, with uh, the Republican Party um, and the Democratic Party for the historians that know that for sure. Um, but you mentioned, uh, you know, pro-life. And, and I ask a question to folks all the time um, because I was registered independent, you know, all of my life until, you know, I switched to, uh, uh, to run on the Democrat uh, ticket. And when people come up to me and they say, you know, Eric, you're running for Congress, huh? But you're running for the wrong party. I remember three ladies at a, a back to school function said this, said that. And I said, well, why do you say that? And, she, and one lady said, I give you three reasons, abortion, abortion, abortion. And I said, well, let's talk about that. I said, if you ask a hundred Democrats, a thousand Democrats, a thousand people, period, if you're pro-life or pro-death, what do you think they're going to say? Right? And the lady's like, they're pro-life. Yeah, I'd say pro-life. Right. Everybody's pro-life. Nobody's pro-death. And I said, I want you to think of something. I have a daughter. She just turned 21. She's the love of my life. But my wife is, she's, she's everything to me. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not going to pretend, pretend to project anything on you. I said, but you think about in your mind. Um, a situation where, you know, an abortion or something like that would be warranted. I said, I said, you go there. I'm not going to project it on you. I said, um, let me ask you something. Who would you want to make that decision? Would you want it to be you, your family, your healthcare provider? 
behind closed doors making, you know, making that decision, or do you want somebody else or the government making that decision for you? I said, when you hear pro-life, it's a marketing term. It's mm -hmm. a, I'm, I'm a pastor, man. I'm from the womb to the tomb, baby. That's what I'm <laughs> talking about. I'm a, and, and, and I'm going to try and write policies to protect from the womb right. to the tomb. Right. But there are situations where it, who's to say, I can't project that on anyone. Right. As a Christian, I have a choice to, to, to believe. Right. And so for me, and, it, and it's on my, uh, in my policy statement on the health care. I'll defend a woman's right to make her own health care, reproductive choices. Why? Because everybody has a choice. And if we have a choice, we'll choose life. But there are situations that come up that right. everybody, I mean, it's, well, every, you, you know, right. life experiences well, are different. Right. Some of them, some states want to, in the case of rape and incest. Rape and, I mm -hmm. mean, yeah, come on. That's like, that's, 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 even somebody that was like with them a little bit when they go that far, they say it's, it's too far. They've taken it too far. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, and like, and like I said, it's, it's about uh, who, who, who gets to make that decision, right? Who gets to make that decision? We, we right. see folks that are, that are saying, oh, you can't t ask them about the vaccine. You can't tell me it's my choice to make a vaccine. If I want to get the vaccine or not. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to get into that. Right. that no, much, that's fine. You, you know that's what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly. it's, it, it comes down to uh, um, an individual. Um, okay. Making, making that choice. Okay. And the, the final political question I want to ask you, and it, out of curiosity more than anything, is I believe that Madison Cawthon got sworn in on the 3rd of January, which obviously we know that was three days before the insurrection. Mm -hmm. And we know that from videotape and him himself, his own words, has just the, the statements that he's made is just insanity. I'm curious as well, have you run into constituents that voted for him, but his stances on Jan January 6th in particular, this is this question about what happened, that they're like, if we would have known he felt like that, even though, how would they know we didn't have an insurrection when he got sworn in? But now that we know where he stands on insurrection, are you finally finding constituents or voters, I should say, that are, are not happy with the, the things that he's saying just strictly about January 6th? Have you run That's across them? Absolutely. <laughs> um, it actually, his uh, uh, his campaign manager, field field manager, um, called me, uh, and 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 he made this. This is public knowledge. You know, uh, former sheriff uh, George Irwin, right here in Henderson County. He's known my family for a long time. We spoke, and he says, Eric, and publicly, he says, I regret uh, law enforcement that I got you to vote for him. Uh, he said, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, but that will never happen again. I run into people all of the time. I run into law enforcement, yeah. you know, um, just folk in the grocery store and restaurants uh, and education, business, you name it, that said, we are, we are, we're, we're beside ourselves. And, and they'll tell me, I voted for him. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. Um, I thought that he would get there and get a, a group of people around him, you know, that will mature and that will help groom him. But all he's, when he got elected, he said he's about comms and not constituents. And he yeah. stayed true to that. We hadn't had um, a representation um, from a member in Congress for the last year. And we won't have it for the next year because he's planning on trying to run in, a, in another district. And so we're left leaderless. And I said doing nothing was no longer an option. And so that's why I stepped in. But I hear it all the time. When I travel from top to bottom, we have 15 counties uh, <laughs> in our district. Um, and, uh, and I hear it all the time when I'm calling folks. I hear it all the time. Uh, and he's from my hometown. Um, you know, he lives 15 minutes from my house, doorstep to doorstep. Um, and so, yeah, I hear it. I hear it more than ever. And, and folks are, are tired of the, um, uh, the bipartisan bickering and arguing because it's the folks in the middle that get hurt. It's the folks that are, you know, between the barbs or the ones that are getting, that, that are taking that, that fire. And, uh, you know, enough is enough. We can no longer do that. We need right. somebody who's going to stand for the people. Yeah. And, and, he, and he hurts his own self because when you get out there and you say things like, don't go to college. I mean, this insanity, things that actually... Come on, he's he's like almost belittling Republican things that they actually like. You know, they they want to say they're the party of family values, all of this type of stuff, and he's running these things down. And you know, and, and the, the misogyny and all that other stuff. Okay, anything <laughs> else? Or you go another hour? Yeah, I know, I know, Brad. We could be I'm, here I'm, all no, night. I'm I'm, very, I'm not even in your state, and I'm very frustrated as an American. You know, I, I just 
I, I hear the things and I, I just don't like it. Um, is there anything else before we segue into the second part of the uh, conversation, which is random fun questions? Is there anything else I, at the very end? I'll let you put out your social media platforms and all that. But is there anything else you would like to discuss politically before we shift into the last part of the interview? Um, I, you know, my mom uh, is 76 years old. She looks like she's 50. My mom is the strongest mm -hmm. person that I know. Um, but we had a conversation a few weeks ago and um, she said, she said to me, she said, baby, I thought that we dealt with this voting back in <laughs> when she was 20, <laughs> right? And back in 65, she said, I thought we already dealt with this. Um, we see that, that our democracy seems to be under assault, um, you know, coming from folks from the far right who are trying to make it harder for people to um, to vote, to let their voices be heard, because they know when we vote, when we show up, when people show up, we win. Um, and people that are in power want to stay in power. And they want to seemingly they want to stay in power by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and you see things that, you know, that happen on January the 6th, all based off of a lie. Yes. You know, uh, and when I talk to folks, you know, if it's out and about and um, they're, they're telling me, oh, the election was stolen. OK. Give me one shred of evidence. Judges that were appointed by the former uh, president looked at everything else presented and said, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. 100 percent of the courts threw it out. Nobody said there's a shred of evidence yet. They still stand by that um, and making it harder to vote. You know, we're taking uh, boxes, you know, <laughs> ballot boxes. Right. Listen, Brad, it, it's, it gets it gets mind numbing sometimes just to think of all of the things, all because they want to stay in power. Yeah. You know, power doesn't change you. It magnifies what you already are. Money yes, doesn't does. change you. It magnifies. It gives you a bigger platform. Yep. And we're now seeing the veil has been torn back. And we're seeing what the heart, what their heart represents. Listen, I've been in games. I've won big and I've lost big. I just want a chance. That's all I want. Just make it a, just, just blow the whistle and give us an even playing field. And may the best person win. I, and yeah. based off of ideas and I literally, I literally yeah, I literally, what you just said, you use it in a, in a football analogy. I literally, two hours ago, I said this to Debbie. I said, I don't understand why, like you said, and you were fair, they, both sides do gerrymandering. Republicans yep. are taking it to a whole new level, <laughs> but Democrats are guilty of it too in the past. Right. However, like you, I'm, I, was, I was a boxer. I want to win fair and square because there's no better feeling than winning fair and square. And in your, in what you're doing, on policies, on what you think is best for people. You know, the, the problem with the Republican Party right now with me, biggest thing is they put self before country. And that's not the way we vote. If you win, the people in your district voted you in. You work for those people, but they forget that. They reverse it. And like you said, they, they go and they get the power. And all it does is really magnify who they really were before. That's right. And That's now right. with social media being around now, and it, that takes it to the to the highest levels because yeah. it's in your face twenty four seven. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's let's throw out. There's no right or wrong questions. Oh, All okay. Fun ones. There's nothing. <laughs> nothing to get you in trouble here. So, <laughs> all fun ones. I got all you. All fun ones. <laughs> what is your favorite genre of movies? Oh, movies. <laughs> My favorite genre. <laughs> Man, I got to say, you know, sci-fi, I'm a Marvel nut, <laughs> right? And I knew once they started making movies about that sort of stuff, man, it was going to break all kinds of records. And every movie that comes out, it breaks a record. So okay, I like sci-fi. Right. So with that said, do you have a favorite or a go-to movie that you could watch over and over again? <sighs> mm. Do I have a go-to movie that I could watch over and over again? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also a comedy guy. I love comedy. Um, you know, it's, it's got some, some, some language in it. I like Harlem Nights. It's, you know, comedy. <laughs> yeah. I love it, man. Della Reese. He shot my pinky toe. My pinky toe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Richard Pryor. 
That was, that was a good one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and life is a funny one too. But oh, once again, it's, it's, it's got some. It's got some language. hilarious. Oh, Martin Lawrence and Eddie, and of course the late Bernie Mac. Right. Okay. Right. Um, do you have a favorite actor or an actor that, if a movie or something comes out, you want to watch it? A favorite actor. Um, you know Denzel's got it going on, man. He, he's a good dude. He can, you know, when I saw Training Day. That blew me away because Denzel is usually the good guy. He's usually the hero. And now he's like, I'll pull, I put cases on all y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, King Kong, yeah. King Kong ain't got Blah, blah, I mean. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Denzel. Yeah. Well, you know what? You shared Denzel, the love of Denzel, who's from Mount Vernon, New York. I had uh, the former uh, assistant uh, uh, director at FBI for counterintelligence, Frank Faglusi, was on uh, Saturday. And I asked the second part of the questions to everybody, and he picked Denzel Washington. He, and I asked him, he, and I asked him a question about who was one of the most realistic FBI agents. And one of them that he said was Denzel Washington. Denzel, he liked yeah. Denzel. Okay, so flip that. Favorite actress. Favorite actress? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I couldn't even. I probably couldn't even tell you the name of an actress. Uh, uh. Name a movie, um, I'll tell you the actress. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man. Uh good gracious. That's a tough one, man. Uh favorite actress. I don't even know if I have a favorite actress. Um huh. Nia Long. Okay. Regina, Reg Regina King. Regina I mean, King she's, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite? Or somebody that you, when you're working out or whatever, or in the car when you're playing music, favorite musical band? Favorite musical band? Oh, come on. Um, I'm having to know. I mean, I like the Doobie Brothers. Okay, well, so does them. She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Do you have a concert, a favorite concert you've ever seen, or a fond memory of a concert you've seen over the years, musical concert. favorite concert, Luther Vandross. Okay, my wife and I went when he uh, came to Barbados, and you know, listening to uh, Big Luther, li listening to Luther um, is almost like the CD. I mean, this guy's voice is like an instrument. Man. I saw it was, him. Uh, it was I saw him, man. Yeah, I yeah. saw Vanessa Williams open up for him up in uh, in Maryland. He was fantastic, and it's it's funny because most people that are fans always say Big Luther. <laughs> it was a small Luther, and it was a big Luther. It was a big Luther, man. That you know, felt like a younger generation looked that up, but he, he, he fluctuated in weight a lot. Okay, yeah. now flip that. Do you have, uh, uh, not flip it, do you have a favorite solo singer? Would it be Luther, or is it another solo singer? Not a band, but a solo singer. Oh, man, a favorite solo singer? Male. Um, male, I'd say Donnie McClurkin. He's a gospel singer. Oh, yeah, I know he is. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, met him, I met him once in, in St. Lucia. Um, okay. Yeah, this, okay. he he has a beautiful voice. He sure does. He sure yeah. does. Okay, now flip that. Favorite female singer. Favorite female singer. Can you? Is Rihanna? Is she considered a singer? Rihanna. <laughs> yeah, Rihanna. Yeah. She's from Barbados, man. That's that's my wife's home country, man. Okay. I, I give some props to Rihanna. She was well, just made a national hero there. But should, I like her. Yeah, th that's for the young generation. Anita Baker, Whitney Houston. Yeah. You know, eh, okay. Whitney Houston, man. Yeah. God okay, well, since soul. you went Rihanna, my favorite Rihanna song is Stay with Mickey Echo. I don't know if you ever heard that. But on YouTube, it's, the name of the song is Stay. Stay. Okay, song. I have to so look Stay. that up. Okay, do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? A favorite noise or sound? Yep. Um, the laughter of a baby. Okay. Flip it. Least favorite noise or sound? Least favorite noise or sound? Um, siren of a, a state trooper behind me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. What is your favorite food? My favorite food? Mm, nothing like a ribeye steak, okay. man. On the, over the coals. Oh, how how do you like it that. cooked? Medium, medium rare? I usually go medium to medium well. You okay. know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't like the 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 blood of the pink stuff, but I okay. could go medium to medium well with that. Okay. What is the first job you ever had? First job I ever had was working in a cafeteria uh, in a, a rest home where my grandmother was. It was called Lakewood Manor. It was over one summer. I worked there for about two, maybe three weeks in the kitchen. Okay. If you hit the lottery tomorrow, 
for the 200, 300, 400 million dollars. If I hit the lottery, okay. What would be the first thing you would do? Tithe. I return a tithe uh, to the Lord, man. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this and see when I throw open the floodgates of heaven. That's the first thing I do. The second thing I do is I would start paying off people's houses, folks in, in my church, man. How much you owe? Here you go. How much you owe? Here you go. Then I look at charities. Okay. Pre-COVID, did you and the missus have a favorite vacation destination? Um, Pre-COVID, our favorite destination, <laughs> Barbados. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Do you have a hobby? A hobby? Yes. I play golf and I bowl. Okay. How about your handicap? Decent? The clubs are the handicap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, um, I, right now, if I went out and shot, I could probably play bogey, uh, you know, shoot bogey golf. 18, I'd say 18 well, to 20, 22. Okay, well, we need, when you win, we need a, a, a political leader that doesn't cheat at golf. No, <laughs> no names mentioned Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm accountable to the Lord, man. If I cheat, I cheat myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, Eric, if you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would your first question or talking points be for that person? If I can meet anyone. Now, the 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 church answer is, is Jesus, <laughs> right? But Jesus. yeah, yeah. That's but, fine. you That's know, um, yeah, I, I'd say Nelson Mandela. I'd love to, to talk to him and uh, okay. just say, just ask him what kept you going. I think I know that answer. But just, you know, what, what kept you going? Okay, well, I want to piggyback on your answer. Something I also constantly put out on Twitter for people that say that the people that did January 6th are political prisoners, which I hate that. The gentleman that he just named, Nelson Mandela and Stephen Biko, those are two true political prisoners. Yeah. That people that attack the Capitol are not political prisoners. No. But that's what they like to say. You know, that's one of their, their things that Marjorie Taylor Greene and a couple other ones say these are political prisoners locked up. The gentleman he just said, remember, Nelson Mandela and Stephen Biko, if you don't know who that is, viewers, watch the movie with Denzel Washington, Cry Freedom. Cry Freedom. about Stephen Biko. And Peter Gabriel had the beautiful song Biko that went on to be a real big song around the world. Okay. Um, with everything we discussed so far, Eric, if you had to sum yourself up, as a human being, what would you say? If I had to sum myself up as a human being, um, love God and love others. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's my, my mission in life is, is to know Christ and to make him known um, and um, treat others with respect and dignity uh, and honor and give them the benefit of their humanity. Uh, and even though you don't agree with someone, even though you don't look like them, you don't work like them, you don't believe what they believe, uh, we still owe them the benefit of their humanity uh, and, uh, and treat them as such. Okay. And finally, I know you alluded to a couple earlier on in the conversation, but I always close out, what is, if you have one, and I know you do because you said a couple, what is the saying you live your life by? <laughs> um, yeah, a saying that I live my life by, um, serve where sent, serve where sent. You know, the world has changed um, by our example and not our opinion. Uh, you know, we have a younger generation that's looking to us to help lead and guide them. Uh, and the question that I'd have for everyone, whether it be a politician, uh, a parent, an uncle, a neighbor, is what are you showing the next generation? You know, if, if you lose, do you you know, pitch a fit and take your toys and go home? Do you fight? Do you, what do you do, right? Are you, are you uh, humble in victory and gracious in defeat, <laughs> right? Everybody's going to lose at something sometime. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's how you lose. It's how you win. You know, uh, it tells about your character. And so, um, you know, I try and treat people with respect and, and dignity and honor and love them and treat them the way I, I want to be treated, you know, which is a golden rule. So, okay. That's how I feel. All right, before we close out and I give a couple of thoughts and I'll give the mic back to you. Okay. If you would go ahead and give the viewers your social media platforms and your website and um, 
uh, donations or whatever you, you got to put out, go for it. Okay. Well, thanks, Brad. It's ericgash.com. That's E-R-I-C-G-A-S-H.com. There, that'll lead you uh, to the donate button. You know, obviously, until they get money out of politics, you know, that's something that we need. That's a shameless plug. I know my campaign manager will enjoy that. Um, uh, at Eric Gash for Congress. Um, but you go to my website and, uh, and that'll lead you everywhere you need to go. So uh, thank you for that opportunity, Brad. Okay, and tell them where they can follow you on Twitter. On Twitter is uh, 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 hashtag <laughs> at Gash for Congress. My, hey man, I got a team. Okay. Uh, I don't do all that stuff, but yes, okay. at Gash for Congress. I believe is what it is. Okay, that's fine. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple of thoughts. I'm gonna give you the mic to close out with your final yeah. thoughts. Win, lose, or draw, and I hope that you win because he needs to be defeated. He, he definitely needs to go. Already in life, from being a pastor, from being a principal to being a coach and caring about people of all colors, all shades, mm -hmm. um, regardless of, of, of religion and preference and all of that type of stuff, you're doing what I try to do in my life. And that's the type of guest that I bring on. You're moving humanity forward. So I thank you for that. And again, I hope you, definitely I hope you win. But win, lose, or draw, like I just said, you have moved humanity forward and we need more people like you out in the community because it's not just government it's you have the community i tell people this you know all the time we want to we want to fix policing and we need to fix policing but we need a community to work with decent police it's not it's it's a whole you know um circle it's not just one piece and government as you know as well as i do can't fix everything so i, I it's refreshing to hear your ideas and your platform and your your um your convictions and uh I appreciate you. I really do. I appreciate people like you. And, and, I, and I don't usually say it, but unless I really mean it, because it's harder and harder to say it for me, but sincerely, God bless you for what you're doing. Um, and, and I wish you the best. What I want to do is give you the mic back. And if there's anything else you want to close out with, go for it. Well, thank you, Brad. Um, you know, it's, it's a time in our, our history where um, doing nothing is no longer an option right? We have to get back, uh, we, or we have to get to the point to where we can treat people like we want to be treated. Look at others as ourselves. Um, I had a shirt that had uh, hashtag see me. When you look at others, what do you see? Who do you see? Do you identify with them? Do you see them as a brother, a, a family member, a, a neighbor, uh, someone who you can sit down and have dinner with? Um, and it's important that we give people the benefit of their humanity. We're going to disagree on things, but we always have to come together with a compromise to help everyone move forward, to help everyone get over this hump. Nobody likes the division that we see. Nobody likes the beating of the drums talking about civil war. That's over. That's done with. We have to move forward. We have to come together, right, as one nation under God and move forward and do it together. Uh, and fulfill those dreams uh, that our forefathers and, and, and ancestors, you know, before them, be, the, the world that they saw, we can make it happen, but it's got to start now. It's got to start with us. Why not us? And why not now? I agree. And on, on that note, I thank you for coming on tonight. And I wish you truly the best. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate you. Keep up the great work. All right. Take care. Bye now. Hey, folks. That's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show, and they can't forget about it. Democratic candidate from North Carolina running against Mass and Cawthorn. Everybody knows from Twitter how I feel about Mass and Cawthorn. So I hope that he is absolutely defeated, and I hope that Eric does it. But as well, listen to all the things that Eric has done even before running for political office. What is he doing? What has he done? Moving humanity forward. My type of guy. My type of person. All right, folks, make sure you follow me on Twitter at BadBradRSR. Again, it's at BadBradRSR. And again, thank you for all the new subscribers. We picked up quite a bit uh, over the last uh, two interviews, three interviews. And obviously, you enjoy what you're seeing. We're going to have more big names coming, more people that are moving humanity forward. All right. And remember, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. Thank you for watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Please follow, subscribe, leave comments, forget about it, and move humanity forward.